Hello everyone, welcome back to Fibbleheim, an acolyte of the altar. Since the last time I played, the devs have released a roadmap for their plans post-launch, and they have already made good on the first one, which is the April 1st update that you can find in the description down below if you're interested. The changes were very minor, but the overall goal was to bring up the Ravagers and the Sylvans while bringing down the uh, oppressive Empiricists. So I thought... It was time. Time to play the tree huggers. So our greater patron shall be Aru, Lord of the Sylvans. Gifts burden you by one less. This is actually quite powerful now that I know what burden does. Uh, so we'll see if we can make good use of it. For our lesser patron, we're going to be doing Ravagers. A lot of the changes to Ravager, or in my opinion, the main change, uh, affected their implings which comes from the lesser patron part so i kind of want to see if that one extra health will push them over the edge to making them slightly more useful and of course with this combination most importantly we get to oppose the greatest of all deities today nest falls hopefully we'll see the biggest part for me though from the roadmap was the uh the planned meta progression that was always my biggest, you know, there's no meta progression. What kind of roguelike is it? But uh, I'm happy to see that. I'm happy to see that, and I look forward to it. So, we have a lone ladybug from our dear Haru. We also have the imbling. Huh. Do I spend my one mana to play a 1-2 or a 3-2? To be fair, it doesn't particularly matter against the sickly serpent skin, who is going to Omnom both of them. Either of them. He'll do it both. Wow, okay. So the, um, this opponent, quite a rude boy, he bites, which of course will attack our leftmost character for two attack. Then he has this mechanic, which... I've never determined how much I like it. I have actually wiped on this guy. I think he is the hardest first opponent in the game. And the reason is, he's going to heal. With the snake blood, he'll restore two life for every time I have been struck in battle. If the number of strikes has reached 16, I will die instead. So in my opinion, the strategy here is to... Just hit him 16 times. That's it. That's my goal. But now, of course, we've gone long enough. The backbite has opened, which means he will be attacking the rightmost minion for two as well. That's why I played the Koi to uh, protect him. And now we shall protect the Koi by playing another Koi. Look at that. Thankfully, as the uh, glorious Ravagers, we have swarmed them. So we're about to get some cannon fodder. I think we'll play a Tiny Disciple. I have never managed to actually kill this character. This, uh, this beast. I always just win based on Snake Blood. Maybe I should have waited for Swipe to go through. In fact, I'm fairly confident I should have waited for Swipe to go through. Ah, uh, maybe not. Mayhaps not. In this encounter, of course, the only important thing is how many times we hit him, not how hard we hit him. They did also increase the difficulty of the rights, which is kind of like the optional difficulty. Apparently that was too easy for people. Um, which is news to me. But I mean, you know, Empiricists, they're kind of like the kings. I've never really meshed well with the Sylphans, so today will be quite the test of uh, their change. I almost killed him. That would have been a first. Would have been a first. The music is getting louder. Did my music settings change or did they increase the volume? Don't know. But anyway, the sickly serpent skin poisoned himself to death. Starting off with a legendary. Oh my. So the Sylphans have, we get to see one of the main mechanics here. Actually two. The first mechanic that we'll talk about, because this is uh, shiny, is Seasons. The Season mechanic, I'm actually not a huge fan of it, uh, to be honest, but the way it works is 
the card will have a season. And which season the card is in is based on how many cards you've played prior to playing it. So spring is first, of course, and that is if you play this card first. Now, Survive the Winter doesn't have a spring effect. It only has a summer effect, which means if you play this card second in your turn, you will gain six borrowed life, which is pretty bloody good. If you play this as your third card, Fall, then you will draw two cards. And if you play it as your fourth card or later, you will do both twice, which is absolutely insane. I won this. This might be my win con. My sustain for this entire deck. The second Sylvan mechanic we're seeing here is they have a lot of spell manipulation. And uh, the Grove Tender is a 4 mana 3, 4. Summon your next spell this turn will double count. So this is actually an excellent card as well. Um, the only spell we have right now, I believe, is the Cannon Fodder spell, the Swarm Them. So that would be an 8 mana combo. We're going to take Survive the Winter. I think that'll be uh, helpful for us. Now, here is the the burden system. Of course, these are the relics. And originally, I was really confused as to what the spiritual burden is. But if your burden, it actually tells you here if you hover over it, who would have thought that? If you have a green, so a light burden, no big deal. Nothing changes. If you have a medium burden, you draw one less card on the start of the fight. And if you have a heavy burden, you draw one less card and begin with one less mana. Which is very not good. But you know what is good? The black ink. Ladies and gentlemen, we won. GG. Uh, let's uh, wrap it up. The black ink is my favorite relic. We picked it up for the very first time in my fir my last episode, actually. Uh, the last video. Well, I picked it up for the very first time in that video. And what it does is... Uh, do not let it deceive you. In our hand here, it is a zero mana, one, one deal, one on summon. That's cool and all. And we could keep it like that if we desired. But we can right click it to change its stats to our heart's content. I have never seen a card like this before. And I love it. What do I think it's going to be this time? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We can also... Hmm, that's actually a really good point. Thank you, Brain, internal monologue. I can use this to trigger seasonal effects. That could be incredible. Hmm. Hmm. Now, it's worth noting that if we are... That goes to my face. Ah, pain. I forgot about that. <laughs> if we... Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. my train of thought. We can use this as a seasonal effect. We can use it as just a big boy. One thing I like to do is I like to make it a 0-1 deal 10 as like a finisher. In fact, <laughs> we can play it right now. Do I? So this is six damage. Next turn. Next turn. I could have played the Overlord here, and it would have been 8 damage. But, uh, we're gonna finish in style. So yeah, that's our, that's our new win con. You love to see it. Bye! Ah. Good shit. I still cannot believe that that is a... A one burden relic. Summon two beast tormentors. I don't know what those are. There we go. 
The Beast Tormentor is a 4-3. Oh, so here's the question. The Beast Tormentor, when played, advances all enemy rage gauges by one, right? But, does it do that if it summons? Probably. This would be ridiculously OP if it didn't. So let's find out. I'm feeling cocky after we got the ink thing, so, you know. The Trixie Hunter or the False Prophet? We'll go with the Trixie Hunter. Still as stone, still as stone. The man mutters, holding his spear close to his chest. Before him graze a small group of fuzzy creatures and their much larger mother. Soup of bones, soup of bones, he says. He raises his spear and begins to charge. Which do you help him hunt? Now, we're down to 17 hit points. We're going to go for the mother, though. Okay, we're down to... That actually rolled really well. To get the filling feast. I highly, 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 highly recommend always getting the filling feast if the opportunity presents itself. Always. At least one. It can save you. It's a card that goes into your deck and heals you for 10 hit points that gives you some... Temporary hit points. Now, we are up against the Angler. I don't like this guy, gotta be honest. But what he does is he's gonna prod us. He's gonna attack this guy for one. And he's gonna give us a lure, a lantern. How kind of him. Except next turn he's gonna kill it. And then it's going to weaken its nearby units by one and deal two to my face. That's exceptionally rude. <sighs> How dare he? Am I just gonna go? We're a savage deck. Let's go. Just kidding. Uh, well, we can still just go. If we play the Lava Smith, uh, this will give one to everything as long as it's an Overlord. Or, you know, Overlorded. So even the Lantern can hit him. And when he, you know, swipes this Lantern and kills it, the Lava Smith doesn't want to attack anyway. He wants to sit there. Now we just go. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. But it's fine. Next turn we win. Boom. Easiest angler of my life. All right, Ravager. I see how it is. I see how it is. Now you might be saying, but Fabe, you have exact lethal. Actually, you have a little bit more. I can count. I was going to say, but you're one short of lethal, but then I have that guy, but then I wasn't one short of lethal. Yeah. Now, so we get to see another mechanic of the Sylvans. That is sap. Now, I am personally not a fan of sapping, although it can be very powerful. Zap completely disables an enemy ability for one turn, and I believe it sets it back. Let's see. Dunn completely resets the cooldown of an ability. It also applies Sap, which causes the ability to skip its next turn. Completely resets the cooldown. Are you sure? Uh, but anyway, the Amber Scorpion is not a sapping card. It's not. It is a card that benefits when you sap, which... I don't know how I feel about that. We also see the Monarch Butterfly once again. The Monarch Butterfly is a 9 mana 6-6. Six, six. The stats are low for 9 mana, but that's because if she's an Overlord, she summons two Lord Bugs who are... 5-5s? Five hey, nailed it. They're 5-5s five who will then summon two Lone Lady Bugs if they are Overlorded as well. So you can actually, in two turns, you can have a full board. A 6-6 six, six and four 5-5s, five fives, which is hilarious. But I think we're not even making it that far yet, so let's take Hibernation. We get to draw a card. If it's a spell, we draw another. If it's a creature, we summon a Charging Bear. And as the Savage Ravagers, we love summoning stuff and then charging stuff. Plus 40 to your max, to your current and maximum life. Okay, you have my attention. Start combat with a 3-1 Raven. When it dies, summon a 3-2 Raven. Then a final 3-3 three, three, Raven. If the final Raven dies, so do you. Nope. 
Creatures played while you have seven or more max mana, summon a one one on death, sure, whatever. The beasts in this game can be wildly unpredictable. Like, take this asshole. This asshole is just gonna wipe the board. And Starbeam hurts. There's no, 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 no. Ladybug. The Ladybug, if you have the Sylvans as the lesser patron, you get three of these uh, in your deck and there's zero mana. So they actually play really well into the seasons, but as it's a Forsaken card, a Forbidden card, excuse me, uh, it costs one mana for us. So it's really not that big of a deal. We need not fight yet. Let us rest a while first. It is not safe here, but I will keep watch. This is from the Unheeded Messenger, who has the messenger from above. He will send a letter to your hand, or you read it carefully. Uh, you have to play it. You can't end the turn without playing it, so... If you want to read it carefully, you can. <laughs> if not, you know, you don't have to. The real question... Is do I play Survive the Winter? I can't. That answers that question. Next turn, he will earn two turns. He'll be slashing, so I guess now next turn. And star beaming, which is very rude. The letter's coming next turn, so let's draw. We got a bear. Here comes the pain! This will deal 3, and that will deal 12. Suffering. Hungry for sacrifices. Fervent acolytes approach. Drop everything and run. Please. Trust me. So we can uh, continue sleeping to restore 3 life, which sounds good, but it fully advances the opponent's rage gauges, which means Calamity will be on the table. And, um... No. Let's get rid of our Lava Smith. We drew an extra card anyway, so it all works out. And I think we're going to play Swarm them. The goal is to flood the board to the point that this Star Beam doesn't come at my face. That's really my goal. Calamity is four turns out. Five mana, five, five. I hope I'm making all swarming decks brown. All swarming Zerg enjoyers. This one's for you. A solar storm approaches. Take shelter in my cavern. We'll lose a mana gem. I'm actually quite fortunate, because usually this, um... Oh, it's winter. I mean, sure. Why not? Uh, usually the message from above is like, take five damage to the face, which is really rude. It's actually going quite well for me right now. Now we have drawn through our deck because Survive the Winter did a lot. Mm, mm, mm. So let's flood the deck some more. I can have six on the field, I think. There you go. This should be a kill. Next turn. Easy game, easy life. I don't need to read this. GG. Sure is nice having units. It doesn't... It feels like when you're playing as the... Uh... Ooh. Interesting. Uh, it feels like when you're playing as the Empiricist, you just don't have units. So, you know. Now we get to choose... We could choose a lone ladybug, which is an odd choice, but it does synergize with uh, our kind of, like, Zerg strategy we got going on. But we have here the Giant Anteater, which shows off the final unique mechanic of the Sylvans. 
And that is infest. It partially shows it off. Like the Amber Scorpion, it's a support for it. Play, summon a copy of me for each enemy ability that is infested. This sounds actually quite exceptional. If I can get some infest rolling. So infest is what the Sylvans mainly got patched uh, in the April 1st patch. And that's because infest, you infest an enemy ability with a powerful insect swarm. So you get to pick like a an effect that happens whenever you metamorphosis the infestation. But of course, we don't have that right now. So is the giant anteater in your good? We might roll. How many beetles do I have? 12? Hey, there's infest. Speak of the devil. And it shall appear. There are better ways to infest besides this. So what if we look for them? This is also buffed. The vein drainer. Um, I still don't like losing a life, though. We could get our, a, like, a YOLO cannon fodder. That could be fun. That fits into our Zerg strat very well. Well, this guy could be good. Shall we try him? Give it a shot. I can always replace it later. The Maestro Maev. Boy, oh boy. Now, the Maestro Maev is actually one of the characters I was thinking about when I was like, hmm, how could this Impling benefit or buff be really good? And this is it. So the Maestro is a potentially dangerous opponent. Of course, I said that multiple times, and we've dominated him every time I've seen him in the past. Because he has three passive abilities. Parry. Counterattack, deal one. If this kills a creature, deal one. Uh... As another counterattack. Not the big of a deal. Piercing gaze, deal one to my face. Rude, but not the big of a deal. And the soothing song. Restore one life to self. Again, rude, but not the big of a deal. Until. 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 Crescendo opens. Now, Crescendo empowers all of his other, other abilities. Raising their effects by plus one. So this parry will become two. This hit to my face will become two. And this soothing song will be healed to, to himself. You can see why this is a little bit more painful. Now, of course, the parry killed that, so it got to swing again. But it doesn't matter that it swung again because we have the Fear Guards Battle Trainer. Which will kill that guy and then do this. That's how fearless works. Oh, man. I mean, three mana, summon three, two, and a five, four. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, we are losing a bit of HP. But remember, we do have the the filling feast in Zippo Gut. Hmm. Shall we play a game? I mean, I'm playing a game right now. I guess it doesn't matter. So I was thinking, I can attack with both, but then he's going to kill this one, and then hit this guy, and then next turn he'll kill this one, and then kill that one. So I could have just attacked with this guy, but then next turn it'd be the same anyway, except I'd be missing out on three damage, so we'll just hit. Excuse me, four damage. And next turn we can call the we can swarm him. If we want to. Uh which I do. Thankfully the parry comes after the attack, so I can still get that damage in. I'm gonna next turn I'm gonna have to attack with this guy. I would love the feast right now. Unfortunate. But we have won. So is it really unfortunate? Because we just attacked everything. And voila! I told you this was my wind gun. 
Ah, the ink drinker. That does not deserve to be a one burden. A one burden card. It deserves to be so much more. Draw a card. Gain one mana per creature summoned this turn. At the end of your next turn, you die. No, I'm good. Uh, another from the ashes. I still haven't used this yet. The Leviathan. I believe this was nerfed. This was nerfed, right? I think so. I think it went from four mana to five mana. Dominate four, charge. Play, grant me twice as much attack as creatures you've summoned this game. So this is a win con card, if I've ever seen one. Of course, dominate four means I have to have four units on the field I'm going to kill, which is a lot. Now, rally is a mechanic I haven't quite figured out. I think the way it works is that you attack first, then you would play this, and then you can attack again. I think that's the way it works. Shall we find out? I don't know if we're going to be able to actually play it, but we can try. Uh, we have a tricky hunter. Shall we do that? Sure. Because we can just hunt the little creatures for a little bit of life. We're up to 14. We have the filling feast in our opening hands. Not the best place for it, but it's fine. We're up against the Hydrozoan hive mines. Ah, this guy. Ironically, one of the few characters that I don't think the uh, eye gouge is particularly good against. Which one is this? So the way he works is he has a few empty slots and he has the stinging swarm. So every turn he will summon a random jelly as a new ability. And right now he has the piercing jelly, which deals one to my face every turn. Rude. However, it has a health bar. And as we punch the boss, the jellies also lose their life. He has spawned now the hungry jelly, which will deal one, and if it kills a creature, it heals the hydrozo and hive mind. Just fine by me. We're going to kill the piercing jelly. And we're going to be confronted with a question. Do I use the Filling Feast to heal? Or do I hold it? Also, my damage here is absolutely nutty. We might kill both jellies, actually. Yeah, we will. Insane. Uh, the long arm jelly, I think, just attacks your board. But now we've reached the point where both Stigny Swarms are open. So we have both the Angry Jelly and the Hungry Jelly. I might not be able to play anything here. Let's see. Nope. Alright. Which brings me back to the question of do I play the Filling Feast? I think I'm going to hold it, team. This was incredible, by the way. I'm like, holy shit. This guy is relatively easy as long as you don't like, get overwhelmed. I want to play Baphomet. Because I want to use this to... Ooh, ooh, I want to use this to test if my rally mechanic is... If I understand the rally mechanic. But it's a Dominate 3. Ah, sure. We'll take it. <laughs> Um, I'm, I really like the new impling, at least romantically. That is not a decision I thought I would ever make. Your spells that cost two or less trigger twice. I possess zero of those. Start a turn, add a temporary swallow to your hand. It reads, deal one. If this kills a creature, gain three borrowed life. Of course, the creatures you're killing are yours. Yeah, I'll take the gong. Maybe we'll find a spell that costs two or less. Although, come to think of it, infest costs two or less, doesn't it? Ooh, that's a good synergy. The Forgotten Warrior. Oh, this is an interesting one. So, if he takes no damage, he restores five life. A lot of life. If he takes ten or more damage, he restores ten life. I screwed up. That's fine. The Sunlit Spear. 
Deal five damage. Overkill damage hits both the next creature and you directly. That's actually really annoying. Hmm. So I have two options here. I can try and get the Ink Drinker out. Or 69. Nice. I'm just going to ignore it. I could have played the Impling as well to eat it, but... This could be a problem for me, actually. Uh... Draw a minion. Shite. Well, actually, that's okay. Play it. Oh, it goes off twice because of the gong, doesn't it? Well, that's fine. Maybe I should have waited. So the Sunlit Spear is coming in. So we'll play a 4-4. That way I'll only take one. We might not really be able to do Baphomet and Leviathan things this turn. Or this, this round, I guess. But something worth noting is that the White Void is coming. really complicates things. I suppose... Hmm. This might be dumb. So I've attacked. Now the question is if I do this... Looks like I reset it. It looks like I understand. Oh, he's going to heal for 10, isn't he? Alright, well, the vo white void's here, meaning everything is dead. So we kind of just throw this turn away. I think what we're going to do... Is we're going to play this guy with as much health as I possibly can. So... Uh, we'll make this deal zero to bring the number down as much as possible. How about 10 health? How about 11 health? How about 16 health? Perfect. That eats three spears. Take it. Remember, he's not here for damage. He's here to soak. He is my soaking machine. I'd really prefer... I can't choose who dominates, by the way. It's YOLO. So, um... <laughs> yeah. We're chilling. We're bang chilling. That's... Six. Wow, that's annoying. Heal for ten. We'll play Survive the Windsor for bonus HP just in case. And now we chill. Remember, if my entire board, now that we've run through the deck, if my board and my hand disappears, I lose. So what we could do, hold on, hmm, we'll see, this is probably a Leviathan play, also I bet, hmm, do I just rib it? We'll rip it after this. 
So I'm dealing uh, three Astrid. I was going to try and math out how much damage I'm dealing to see if it's worth trying to stay below 10 damage dealt. And it probably is, to be honest, but... Me math no good. <laughs> My quick math is very bad. I have to sit there and think about it for too long. I think I know the equation to find it out easily, but that would involve me doing the equation. Here we go. Okay, I'm not a fan of who I ate, but I'm also about to deal 38 damage to his fo Okay, that's how the Leviathan works. Cool! <laughs> All right, the Leviathan's my win con. Got it. Oh, so here's the stun. Stun completely resets the cooldown of an ability. That's probably worth it. Draw a card. We have another hibernation, and then we have the Emperor Dactyl, which is another season card. If it's played in spring, it gets... Oh, sorry. I mean, had the mic there. Uh, if we play in spring, so if this is the first card we played, it gains frontline, so it will go to the leftmost position. If we play it in summer, it gains charge, so it can attack the turn it summon. And if we play it in winter, we summon Perinthia, the Black Death. Hmm. Uh, which is a cool endgame card. Here she is. Uh, she's on summon. She infests three enemy abilities. And if she's an overlord, she spawns the metamorphosis into your hand. So the idea would be... Actually, it's kind of busted, isn't it? The turn you summon her, she infests three abilities... And because she can't attack on the turn she summons, she will print you a metamorphosis to proc those next turn. That's cool. Unfortunately, I've never gotten a chance to use her, but that's cool. With our Zerg-like strategy, I think I'm just going to take Bear Trap. And we're going to bring it over from the ashes. I think that's what we're going to do. I really like the new implings. Speaking of, speak of the devil and it shall appear. Say hello to the shambling city. This is a fun mechanic. Is fun the word? Fun's the word. The way this guy works, I might have screwed up here. I screwed up here. I should have played this one first. He has remaining residents in his shambling city. And uh, it has a health bar, so as we hit him, the volley of rubble which is attacking me will deal less and less damage. So as of right now, he has no remaining citizens. Poor him. How unfortunate. What a shame. If only he could proselytize more of them. So when this is ready to go, it will kill the weakest unit. I believe it is based off of their attack. So this lone ladybug is about to get domed. So, shall we roll the die? Good enough. It's 11 attack. Oh my god. It's based off of his H the boss's HP, right? So in the Shambling City has, I think, the highest HP in the game. So, the amount of citizens you get is based off the attack of the weakest unit. So the Lone Ladybug was actually an exceptional thing uh, to lose there. I mean, why not? Let's go. Team? I think we won. Now, Titanic Strike is coming in. This will deal five with overkill, meaning four is uh, coming to my face right now. Don't really appreciate that. There are two things we could do about it. And we're going to do none of them. Cool. <laughs> I'll eat the four. Because we are going to uh, plop down the lava smith, smack him in the face, and boff him at his ass. Not great hits, but uh, it did let us keep this 12 that's going straight into his dome. I think I figured out how to play the Ravagers, Tim. <laughs> now, White Void is opening up. 
goes the proselytize. Uh, which means my board is going to be wiped, but that's why we picked up the bear trap. Boop. That will stun the ability and completely reset it. Yeah. We have eye gouge at home. Now the question is, do I think I'm going to win before the next Titanic Strike and thus should play Survive the Winter? I do, but let's play it just to be safe. Well, just to be safe. You never know, something strange could happen. Like this proselytize could make him hit for six. Which is not something strange that's going to happen, it's something that's going to happen. Out of curiosity, if I were to say... Deal 13. Hmm, that's what I thought. <laughs> oh, this deck is good. Pass down the crown, huh? So I saw this. When I first saw this, I was like, oh, a three mana summon a monarch butterfly? That's amazing. But uh, that does mean this has to be the fourth or later card you play. Which is a little bit of a big deal. There's no spring effect, by the way, so this has to be at least the second card played to summon the Lone Ladybug. And a three mana Lone Ladybug is not great. The Mushroom Bomb. Oh. <laughs> the start of the turn, or the game, draw me. On turn start, reduce my cost by one. Deal 40 damage. So if you think something's going to go late, uh, that's a pretty good card to have. Summon all... Hey, what? Metamorphose. Summon all infested creatures. Draw a card. This is the card that triggers the infestations on abilities. I'm going to reroll. Create a random Sylvan spell in hand. That could be kind of good. But what if we just keep re-rolling? Discard your lowest cost creature, I gain their stats. Uh, probably not good. This Don't be deceived by this deal 20. This is because that guy has 100 max HP. We're going to take the Lord Bug. I think he'll be useful for flooding our board with stuff. And you know what? He's going in over the Koi. I love playing Koi at 5 mana anyway, so. Uh, we can gamble our beetles. We can do another Trixie Hunter, really? Do I have to cut a card for this? That'll be a good science. I don't. Okay, that's good to know. Oh. I don't like this guy. <laughs> Alright. That's fine. This is the King of Beggars. Shit. Should have played the butterfly. Uh, so the way this guy goes... There. Take that. Okay, good. The way he works is he has a bull, which has seven coins in it. It has a hit point, so it can be reduced. And hard up. He has a counterattack. Deal five to the, four, the first back row target. Then lose one coin from beggar's bull. Can hit directly, so it can hit my face. Uh, this ability also triggers like normal during the beast's turn. So if I hit him... It goes to my face, right? Very unfortunate. However, if he... So what I want to do is I want to have two minions on the board for this. So I guess we're going to have another Ink Drinker moment. Uh, and then he has Down and Out. So if he possesses no coins. 
he deals 13. The Acolyte also damages King of Beggars by the same amount. Does he deal 13 to my dome? Or to this? It should be to this, right? Take that. I don't know if I should have done that. Okay. Now, if you are playing with Empiricist and you eye gouge hard up, uh, he does nothing. You completely disable this boss. Oh yeah, and Passing Strangers uh, adds one coin to the Beggar's Bowl and gives him five life. So that is our ideal target for the Bear Trap. But we could also Bear Trap hard up for a turn if we're going to deal... You know, a lot of damage. This is kind of annoying. How much health can you get for six mana? Nine. I could also... About 11. That'll do. Oh, and he dealt one. Cute. So we'll just let this thing tank for a little bit. It's very unfortunate. Ah, it'll be okay. So he's out of coins now. That immediately dealt 13. Holy shit. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm gonna stun that so this guy gets to summon stuff. We're now in fall so I could draw cards. Is it worth drawing cards? No, this needs to be a winter. Okay, so down and out's not out. Or not casting. He did not overlord. My brain is braining. If I attack him, I he loses his last coin. What if we do nothing this turn? The last coin's coming in. Did I break it? Also, why aren't you overlording? Is it because I'm not attacking? Science. Yes, it was because I wasn't attacking. Oh! I broke it. Fair enough. <laughs> he lived at one. Of course he did. So, um, the stun trap isn't meant to permanently disable this. It's meant to be a one-turn disable, but it just turned it off. All right, fair enough. Your next spell is turn cost seven mana. No, I'm not interested in that. We have an infest. I wanted to do an infestation build. Oh, here, look, Griff. This is one of the interesting cards, I'd say, for the Sylvans. They create a copy of a card in hand, and if it's a spell, you get an additional copy. So you can make three copies of a card. This can help fluff out your deck in the end game. And that's kind of the only thing I think about it. So I'm actually going to put this in a Lava Maw Smith position, and we're going to go face off against Gnest in the altar. Welcome to the hardest boss fight in the game. And of course it would be the patron of the Empiricists. Freaking Knest. I'm not going to do anything turn one. So uh, this is Knest. As you can see, he looks awesome as hell. But he is infuriating. Uh, he has two abilities that are open right now. The Lorentz Crunch are these little void things. I can't have any more than four characters 
on the board at one time, which isn't that big of a deal because he just blows them all up. He deals five with overkill every single turn. So my uh, relatively low health deck is suffering tremendously against him. It's very rude. Uh, he also has eye for an eye, so the first card I play that costs five or more mana will be negated, and then this ability is destroyed. So I only have two and a half cards that beat that meet that condition. One, of course, is the Leviathan, which is my wind gun. Very rude. The other is the Lord Bug, and the third is the Ink Drinker that has been modified, because I think I have to modify this to tank the Hyper Star Beam, uh, like I did with the Divine Spear earlier. I think that's the only way I can win. Which kind of hurts my soul, to be honest. And I don't think I can afford to take five so I have to just throw these away to try and shield my HP a little bit, because I don't have a lot of it, unfortunately. I think the only way I win this is with Graft Bear Trap shenanigans. I legitimately think that's all I've got. His other abilities are now open. He has Melt Mind, which will discard the cheapest card in my hand, so I do have to uh, modify this. I'd like this to be a 16 HP so he can eat uh, three Hyper Beams for me. A 0, 16 is a 7 cost. But then, of course, it gets devoured by eye for an eye, so we have to keep that in mind. Um, we have Elucidate, which will summon a 1-1 one, one Chosen of Kness to the front line, so it'll go here. The reason why that's important to remember is because Hyper Star Beam will then hit it in deal 4 to me. And then Infinite Potential increases his max life by 7. So as we are being chipped away, he is slowly getting farther and farther and farther away. This is a tough fight. I honestly don't know what the answer... <sighs> the answer is... That was Graft. Uh, that was pretty important to my strategy. In fact, it might be fair to say that was my strategy. Because with Graft in hand, I can have three bear traps. So I'm going to try this uh, without it. But I have low expectations. I can Lord Bug to break the eye for an eye. I'm going to go for this. I'm just going to go for the kill. See if we can come close. There goes the coin. So I can bear trap now. Would be more helpful later. We can fell garden. I should get rid of a good one. And then uh, survive to eat a little bit of more damage. Oh, I just realized. I don't have enough mana to play Bear Trap and Ink Drinker. I mean, there's not enough mana in the game. Without Trink. So instead, what do we do? Considering that I have these minions here, I think what we'll do is we'll make this a big damage thing. No, <laughs> not that many. Be reasonable. <laughs> 16. Okay. Uh, can I bring this down to 5? 13. 12, 11, 11, 1. I don't know if I have four turns left in me, but let's do it. Oh, it's still gonna... <sighs> Nine. Ten and a four? It is cool. 
We're just gonna swing it for 10. Here goes my bear trap. Oh god, that was my plan. Okay, so that killed that guy, which is fine. Okay, let's break eye for an eye. Oh, I think I got it. Holy shit, I got it. I take three here. We did it. Holy shit. Three HP and a dream. GG, Ink Drinker. You were the wind con again. Oh. That was so hard. That was three tries. The Acolyte's journey completed. Haru absorbed the offerings of flesh. At last, her siblings culled from every field and forest. No one was left to interfere with life and death. Isn't she beautiful? Is that symbol there? All three of the patron gods have been appeased. They alone have stood the test of time. Which brings the next question. I didn't like fighting Kness. Uh, I Lowane hasn't been in a video technically, but I have beaten him. Um, he's actually pretty tricky as well. I think in terms of difficulty, I would go Kness. Loane Haru. I think. It also depends a lot on... Like, your deck has a huge... impact on which of these is difficult. Like, I've stomped Haru every time. I didn't have to restart once because I was silly. And Loane has killed me a few times as well, off camera. But I still think this guy's the hardest. Like, he just cheats. You cheating sod. A very blue of you. But, my friends... That has been all three of the patrons. Feel free to let me know if you'd like to see some of the challenges or if you'd like to just wait until the meta progression is introduced to the game. I am not opposed to either. These were buffed uh, to become slightly more difficult. But, um, you know, I don't know what the point is. We could always find out together. But thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. Thank you to the patrons and the channel members who support the channel. I greatly appreciate you. If you'd like to stay up to have a channel, feel free to join the Discord description down below. And I will see you next time. Bye.